So Taboo Topics um, is set up so that we have someone come and talk about a topic that is sometimes not necessarily the most um, engaging topic for people to have. Um, sometimes maybe people avoid talking about some um, controversial or tough issues um, and how it relates to our everyday world. So um, that's what we'll be doing today. Um, and we have an excellent speaker here, but I wanna set up a little bit more about some etiquette rules for Zoom and then I'll introduce our speaker. So we will have um, Dr. Kira Lavelle speak and then we will have some time for discussion and questions. Um, so save questions and comments during the presentation portion for um, the discussion and comments. Um, we also ask that you stay muted unless you're invited to speak and I also have the ability to mute so I will be doing that. And um, a couple of other ground rules. If you have your camera off, that is totally fine. You are not um, required to have it on at all, um, but unmute if you want to speak and are invited to speak. Um, and near the 50 minute mark, I will put a link into a survey um, and that will count for attendance or class participation if that is why you are attending. But all attendees are required to fill that out. So please do when it's put into the chat. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Kira Lavelle is an assistant professor of history at the University of Utah's Asia campus. She teaches courses on US history and global citizenship. She has history even with the Hoosier State um, as she completed both her master's and her PhD in American studies at Purdue University. Um, and it is here that she was awarded the Purdue Research Foundation Fellowship for her dissertation titled Radical Manifest Destiny, Mapping Power in Urban Space in the Age of Protest. And it is this that based her book project that looks at how parks across the US center justice movements. Um, and with that being said, I would like to welcome Dr. Kira Lavelle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Garrett. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Indiana State University. Um, I think this is a really amazing series that you have of taboo topics. Um, so I'm super excited to be here and feel kind of honored to, con to consider people's parks a taboo topic. Um, so I love it. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, one thing I'm going to do first is give you, because I'm going to share my screen, but just in case something happens, um, I am going to give you the file for my slides. So I found that this can kind of cement, I'm just copying the link now, kind of can cement that way if I, if I have any um, glitches because of sharing, sometimes I can lock up, I can stop sharing and everyone can still be on the same page uh, because you'll have my slides. So there we go. I just pasted it into the chat. Um, I when I share my screen, it is really diff I don't know if you guys use Zoom at NDSA, but when I share my screen, it is really difficult to see the chat. So if you type questions in there for me, I won't be able to see them, but I think Garrett might be monitoring the chat. Is that right? Okay, cool. Great. So therefore, you are more than welcome to put things in the chat. I just won't be able to see them as we go along. Um, I'm also just really bad about that anyway. So, uh, but yes, thank you so much for being here. My name is Kira Lovell and I teach at Utah Asia Campus. I am uh, zooming in to you from Korea this morning. Um, so I'm excited to be halfway across the world from you right now. So let us begin. One second while I get started. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Can I get, okay, great, thumbs up. The silent thumbs up, very helpful, thank you. Okay, cool, so this is what we're looking at today, the people's parks. Um, hopefully I have my um, text over here. You do not see a bunch of text pop up over your slides, right, Garrett? Okay, cool, excellent. Sorry, it's always so awkward, like jumble of getting started. Okay, excellent. So yes, the title okay. for today's- If we're supposed to be still on Google Chrome, it's on Google Chrome still. On, do you see the slides? We see the slides, yeah. 
Okay, excellent, perfect. Um, the People's Park Imagining a New, I just have my script over here. So if something magically happens and you pop up seeing my script, I don't wanna read you a book <laughs> and uh, instead of showing you the slides. So just remind me and I'll show you the very exciting pictures uh, instead of showing you the book that I'm reading. Um, anyway, okay, so thank you so much. Also, I just wanted, because I have my contact information right here, um, I, you are more than welcome. I always encourage people to contact me on social media. Um, I I've just found that um, for any students that are in the room, maybe I conflict with some of your professors, uh, but I found that in grad school, it was really helpful to use social media in this world to connect with scholars, especially Twitter. Academics are not super on Instagram, but on Twitter, um, at the like end of your fingertips, you can connect with historians all over the world. Um, and regularly, if my students have a question uh, that I can't answer, type it into Twitter, and then maybe within 24 hours, you've got some of the best scholars in the world that are answering your question. So I say that to mean, in case professors in here in this room are telling you not to get on social media, I'm going to already at uh at this time of day counter them but you know take it or leave it anyway you can connect with me on there i'm happy to connect with you if you have any other questions i'm happy to follow up with you um so let's move on here we can see one second okay so here uh, we can see a map of people's parks now what is a people's park Sorry, one second, let me start my timer. I tend to get wordy. I don't wanna make sure I'm following your time. Okay, what is a people's park? A people's park, uh, so often named in this sort of, I'm looking at the late Vietnam War era, late Cold War era, is an illegal park. So like, let's begin first step. It is an illegal park. Um, it's illegally created often on a vacant space, usually a vacant urban green space. And the point of calling it a park is that it includes programming. Now programming can be um, event spaces um, for uh, debates, for music performances, um, the, uh, the theater. Um, it could also be food spaces like food cooking and sharing. Um, it can be um, uh, urban gardening, it can be architecture, um, design projects, uh, free sharing things. Um, it can do, include a lot of different things. Um, so just ha it's illegal. Let's start first because I feel like I always get questions at the end that are like, well, what about the, these real parks? They're not, <laughs> they're, they are completely illegal um, and they're created as forms of protest. So between the late 1960s and late 1980s, which is the period that I look at, groups across the country, and I focus on the U.S. history, there are other uh, parks elsewhere. It's just not my strength of research and it's really hard to get to those archives, especially right now in a pandemic. Um, but my research concentrates on this U.S. Uh, wide movement. Uh, groups across the country spontaneously constructed illegal and informal parks, often on vacant lots, to challenge the displacement that they felt due to police brutality, racism, and urban renewal. So in my work, I argue that the visual material and performative culture of people's parks uh, from their design to the events that they hosted, united different communities through the shared goal of asserting power by claiming and creating urban green space, these shared urban spaces, or I guess I should say shared urban social spaces. So at the same time, my work analyzes how male dominance and the exoticism of the racial other were two dominant visual regimes within these spaces, which we'll look at a little bit today. So the, one of the first examples that we have is, or I shouldn't say the first, it is by far the most famous example. And you'll see a lot of my sources, um, um, uh, visual sources are on that today. I have a lot of other text sources from a lot of other parks, but the creators of Berkeley's People's Park used their own social media um, to relay their issues, to relay photos of the park, videos of the park, there are documentaries filmed in the park. Um, and so therefore I have the most amount of visual imagery that's appealing for our presentation from Berkeley's People's Park. Um, and it is a strong sort of anchor for my project, but it, it by no way means that that is the only information that I have. So this is what you can see is a map of Berkeley's People's Park as of May 15th, 1969. It was about a month before this that it started to be created. It had been a vacant lot for, I believe, about two years by this point. So 
in this, if you can see a little bit, we have some of the programming here that I was talking about. They were planning to expand all the way to that um, left. Um, that on the top of you can see that north indicator that heads to UC Berkeley campus. This is very a uh, quick walk from campus, but you can see some of the programming. Um, they wanted to have a fish pond. Um, they had this giant in the bottom right corner. They had this giant no uh, sculpture that you could sit on, like it was long, uh, huge enough that you could sit on the top of those letters. Uh, playground. There's a ton of kids, um, like. A lot of uh, locals had kids, street people, hippies. There's just a lot of kids in a lot of the photographs that are playing. Um, there's a fire pit, food spaces, um, and then there's some odd things uh, like the there's a miniature Mexican uh, corn garden. There are some other things that we're going to talk about today. So comparing the ways in which park creators designed park visual and material cultures reveals how insurgent park creation at times became a medium for coalition building that imagined a transnational, transhistorical, and cross-cultural community of resistors to displacement in the urban realm. So using their bodies, design, the landscape, and the media, activists argued that the issue of spatial citizenship intersected with discourses of race, class, and ethnic self-determination, as well as gender empowerment. We sort of have at this late 60s, early 70s, especially, we just have like, I always call the 1970s a hot mess, and we just have a hot mess of issues in which we are trying to understand those intersectional parts of our identity, identity as well as those, the sort of matrix of oppression that's happening right now, and those are manifesting through this visual material and performative culture um, in, I would argue, very problematic ways, but still very interesting ways to see how they're negotiating this at this time period. So here is a poster again from Berkeley's People's Park. It's called, it's really famous. It's called Who Owns the Park? Um, that is, if you don't know um, your indigenous people, that is a picture of Geronimo. Um, and so what we, what we can see is that sometimes um, uh, certain imagery of people of color, especially Native Americans or African Americans, uh, becomes key to these spaces. Um, so at times racial play within parks function to reaffirm white middle class privilege for park creators who felt like they could use this imagery to escape the racialization of criminality that became projected onto people's parks. So here, for example, we have a poster created by the Ber uh, one Berkeley's park creator. Um, I would also say that just because a lot of parks are created by a lot of different people insurgently and the whole form is that um, a lot of parks are, uh, their design elements are ephemeral and also sometimes they're designed in disagreement. Um, so I say this is one park creator, but it becomes really famous and a lot of park defenders sort of take up this poster as part of the reason why they should have a park. Um, so they create this park, I mean, they create this, uh, this poster when Berkeley's People's Park um, is, becomes occupied by the police um, about a month into its design. So their tactics of integrating race and gender into their visual material and performance culture often in, offer insight into the problems and perils with current methods of spatial reclamation, as well as a form of power that similarly seeks to build new worlds on top of the old. So. Um, with that pun intended, let's begin to break ground on what some of these parks actually look like. So here you can see a photo of a shirtless man at Berkeley's People's Park. Um, in the Bay Area local news footage of the construction of Berkeley's People's Park in the spring of 1969 captured white men's repetitive penetration of the rocky terrain with these phallic acicular pickaxes. Their sweaty shirtless torsos are sexualizing the nature of men's bodies and park manual labor in very intentional ways. So that's sort of one uh, dominant theme that you'll see in the, these visual iconography of these parks. Here you can see a, a picture of, a, it's a park called the Poor People's Park, created by the Young Lords in Chicago about the exact same time. At Chicago's Poor People's Park, at Chicago's Poor People's Park, created in Lincoln Park during the summer of 1969 by a coalition of Puerto Rican, African American, Mexican American, and white social justice groups, men's laboring bodies and footage still commands the viewer's attention. 
We also have a photo of Chicano Park, a video footage of the first day of Chicano Park in San Diego. Uh, um, this one year later in 1970, this takeover focused on dozens of men pickaxing the dry desert soil underneath the overpass. Um, so while this, this many other parks are created in urban spaces, um, this one is actually created under a highway and they're protesting the highway because the highway cut through um, this Mexican and Mexican American neighborhood in San Diego. Um, and they had, because the highway cut through the neighborhood, um, they were requesting a park to be built. And instead on this, they were actually requesting a park to be built on this spot. Um, and instead of building the park, the city um, began building a police patrol, like a highway patrol center. And so as soon as they saw the bulldozers start breaking ground on that highway patrol center, they just took over the bulldozers and started building their own park. So while women hoe, rake, carry, and cook food, men operate heavier machinery, pickaxe the ground, shovel sandy soil, and raise the Chicano flag in acts of insurgent nation building. So both race and gender remained key politicized components of the design, labor, and memory of these park projects. So some parks like Sam Young Park, um, and correct me if I'm on my pronunciation, you're welcome to unmute yourself and correct me on uh, pronunciation. Um, I just find that's very important working in Korea to get your pronunciation right. So uh, some parks like Sam Young Park, as well as the Young Lords People's Park in Chicago and the Chicano Park in San Diego were created as forms of racial self-determination in which groups of color are specifically articulating that this park creation is a way to reclaim land, reclaim power for their racial and ethnic group. So I have this photo that is not a photo of the park, but it's just a, uh, a newspaper article in the Berkeley Barb of Sam Young Park. So a little more about Sam Young in case you're not, or Sammy Young is what they call here. Samuel, Samuel Young Jr. was his official name. Um, if you're not sure who he is, he was a 21-year-old enlisted service member in the Navy for two years during the Vietnam War before he was medically discharged. And so he later became an active member of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was the sort of a college age level um, student activist powerhouse for the civil rights movement at this point. So Young was the first black college student to be murdered when protesting a segregated whites only bathroom. Um, he was fatally shot by the gas station attendant, Marvin Stegrist, who was 68 years old, after an argument over the use of the restroom after he had purchased gas. Um, and so an autopsy was performed um, and the medical examiner, medical examiner um, determined that he had died from hemorrh hemorrhaging due to a gunshot to his left eye. So just wanted to let you know that even as um, we were still dealing with these issues today, especially of police brutality against African Americans, um, especially over contests of who has a right to public space, um, who has a right to exist, even live in public space. Um, and these are issues that are not just current now, but are embedded in part of this environmental justice movement that's happening. So uh, three days after his death, SNCC actually became the first civil rights organization in the US to oppose the Vietnam War, um, and partly on the grounds that young, um, li that like young, um, innocent civilians and soldiers as pawns should not face deadly violence. So I think it's interesting that just a few years later, um, one of the, the sort of uh, series of parks in the Bay Area that pops up is by um, the Sam Young organization um, that's African-American centered up in a, in a way to not only uh, create um, uh, gardening for the African-American community as land reclamation, but also as memorialization to this student. Um, and also I think it ties in with this is uh, the Bay Area, especially in Berkeley, is this um, ep a really important epicenter for um, college activism. And so many of these park creators across the country um, are also, some of them are getting their roots in civil rights uh, movement organizing before these park creations, like in SNCC. You can actually see some um, direct correlations between Berkeley's People's Park creators and SNCC. All right, let's move on. 
So this is another photo, uh, a color photo of Berkeley's People's Park, just one day in that park. So while never using the term gender neutral, park creators often envision these projects as shared work with men, women, and even children actively taking part. Um, it's often the ideal not necessarily how it functioned. So everyone gets a blister. It became an anthem of, for example, Berkeley's People's Park um, as a way to communicate gender neutrality. Um, it was visually reinforced through photographs from the park's first days featuring kids and adults and women all taking part in wielding tools. So this is not from the sort of first newspaper coverage. This is, I believe is a still from um, a documentary, I could be wrong. Uh, but in the first newspaper coverage of the park, they really wanted to show women. And what's interesting is that I was able to talk to the photographer slash um, assistant editor of the Berkeley Barb that made Berkeley's People's Park famous and I was asking them about um, gender and representation in photos and it was really funny only because he was like there were so many guys and w we wanted to show women in the photos to get like to get more hot girls there essentially like we wanted to show hot girls in the photos to get more guys interested, to get everyone interested. And so I think what's interesting is that intentionally in the newspaper, they're not actually going for gender neutrality. I think it was, let's show hot girls that they can come to this park too. Uh, but oftentimes he was saying that like, cause he photographed you, you know, thousands of photos there in just a few weeks. Um, and most of your photos is guys working that it was definitely like a, a, a space for sort of performance masculinity. Um, but they tried when they could to get photos of women. So everyone gets a blister became an anthem of Berkeley's People's Park. Uh, working alongside both women and men allowed many to see how traditional ideas of men's strength and natural ability reinforced gender role stereotypes that they could challenge in the park. So for example, in a moment of self-reflection, a group of women on the first day of creation of Berkeley's People's Park began comparing their calluses while privately critiquing men's gardening skills, noting how they could pickaxe better than any of the men. Um, another uh, famous image of Berkeley's People's Park. Um, this is this poster comes out after the park is occupied by the police. Um, but in, in addition to like every sometimes in this um, in the memoirs and testimonies of park creators that are women. It's interesting because I don't think guys really um, talk a lot about this stuff, but a lot of the women really want to prove that this was like a gender neutral space of equality. Um, and so they talk about everyone gets a blister and they talk about this phrase sod brother um, that we need to sort of, uh, but as a sort of a thing that they appreciated, not as an excluding sisters of we're sod brothers in this. So uh, the park as a new frontier created endless opportunities for work and many women felt liberated feeling that their manual labor was valuable. So manual labor not only enabled women to physically and performatively prove their radical politics at a time in which it was, uh, it's talked about in the women's liberation movement that it's really hard to move up in, in uh, male centered, male organized, male dominated uh, protest groups because oftentimes women would get stuck with the, you know, the shit work of getting coffee or things like that. Uh, so manual labor not only enabled women to physically and performatively prove their radical politics, especially in physical ways, but the flexibility of work and the park's leaderless structures often created a system in which women felt like they could make immediate autonomous decisions about how they would participate in this activism. Here is a photo of women at Michigan Tech's um, People's Park which is interesting because it actually has like a formal sign on day one. They were like, we are going to make an official people's park. So the democratically insurgent, excuse me, give me some water. The democratically <clears throat> insurgent qualities of people's parks made women's design work <clears throat> at times sporadic, as in the case of Sandra Dufosse, who designed a walkway um, with gathered bricks from a nearby demolished church at Berkeley's People's Park. Um, similarly in Houghton, which is where you can see here, uh, female, female college students at Michigan Tech University were photographed planting flowers under the officially carved park sign of their campus People's Park. 
Despite the ephemerality of parks, women were key urban designers whose identity politics as a basis for their political interests shaped the organization and experience of these spaces as mediums for consciousness raising. So Liz Christie, a Puerto Rican in New York, coined the term guerrilla garden um, by leading a network of inner city vegetable gardeners who converted vacant lots into local food sources in the 1970s. So despite the liberationist aspects of park construction, many parks recruited the support and expertise of architects, designers, landscape architects, or more, uh, or famous political leaders that still often reinforce a narrative of the objective white male. Um, and so here for some local Midwest fla uh, flair, I have a photo of Walden Park. Um, in Madison. So in Madison, Berkeley, and Chicago, women worked with uh, male landscape architects and architects to petition for these spaces as experimental community design projects um, while still occupying vacant lots. So at one of these several people's parks in Madison, Wisconsin called Walden Park, members of the Zoe Bayless sorority worked with the University of Wisconsin Landscape Architecture Department to insurgently convert their vacant lot into a walkable prairie to test the negative impact of car exhaust on native plants. So although the women were the main laborers, the original creators um, of this park Professor Daniel Morrison became the spokesperson for the park. So when he published an article in the New York Times on the project's effort to create a pure ecosystem, um, that's what he, his words, not mine, these uh, women were non-existent. Um, so in one photograph of Walden Park, um, uh, a suited white male professor, that's Morrison, he aims his shovel towards the dirt while the three well-dressed women, white women, the park founders circle him. Um, smiling while looking down at his symbolic groundbreaking. So the recurrent visual pattern is often that men's bodies are dominate the landscape uh, and the machinery producing this space is an extension of their bodies. So for parks that survived police violence, which is almost always present in all of these parks, if they survive police violence, political bureaucracies, internal turmoil, um, weather, I mean, honestly, like a lot of these parks are created in the summer, it's really hard to maintain them, um, especially when people are getting arrested. The early focus on men's bodies and park visual culture and coverage has shaped the historical memory of this movement, often erasing women, immigrants, people of color, and queerness. Um, and I would say that is even more so because the visual iconography of Berkeley's People's Park um, so dominates the narrative so much, um, and that oftentimes their, um, their park is centered on white people. But we do have many other stories that I put in conversation. So this is a photo of Chicano Park. So remember when I uh, was telling you about how Chicano Park in San Diego, um, it was built under the overpass. So you have your, the park is kind of in many ways a little bit overshadowed by all of those concrete pillars. So they didn't just, it, I mean, it took a few years, uh, but they decided to just use that as part of a, um, uh, a landscape for painting, um, like instead of it feeling like it's a little concrete jungle, instead they were like, nope, we're gonna bring uh, color to this desert. So very few activists created parks from this era survive today. Chicano Park, um, what you can see here, just a, um, a snapshot from the park that you can see here, it has not only survived but thrived because of its expansive mural campaign that was adapted over the years as women have demanded a greater role and representation within this space and within the Chicano movement. So Chicano Park, uh, uh, Chicano Park, Chicano Park was born out of a protest seeking to reclaim land under construction to become that state highway patrol office. Um, and so therefore, rather than ripping out those concrete pillars that overshadowed their once vibrant community, the creators of Chicano Park embraced them. When the murals were first added, vivid and large depictions of male revolutionary leaders of color painted a picture of transnational resistance that American colonial textbooks had erased. Um, yet women from the very beginning of these murals increasingly complained that the murals of women at that time 
all painted by men uh, because men in this park maintained absolute control over who got to paint the murals. Um, it was not sort of an, you had to go, they had a bureaucratic structure in this park um, and so it was not leaderless. Um, so the women complained that the murals painted by men failed to depict the complexity of women's experiences, the strength of women's leadership uh, and physical labor in the Chicano movement and in Chicano Park. In addition, Chicanas uh, argued that the beauty of brown skin tones um, in ways that had been captured in representations of men were not being captured in rep representations of uh, women. So men dominated the focus of these murals in the park and a mural depicting the Chicano Park takeover. Women are peripheral, like literally on the ends of the image um, and passive while men's muscles are flexed or their bodies painted in striking poses. Um, the visual representation, repetition of men's bodies reinforced images of specific masculine fighters who defended oftentimes represented as the anonymous and still like passive women. Okay, so while men's bodies in action visually dominate coverage of people's parks, women like Wendy Schlesinger, who you can see on the left, um, felt that who felt alienated in mainstream society in some ways, they were still attracted to the performance of park creation. This is a photo of Wendy Schlesinger and Leanne Chu um, that you can see here, which is really adorable because Leanne Chu, if you just a notice thing in her dress, you have her cigarettes like tucked in there. So I just think that's really cute. She's actually um, a local clothing designer at this time period in Berkeley. Um, and so uh, she, it's interesting how, when, the ways in which she percolates um, through these parks. Okay, so while uh, park readers like Wendy Schlesinger, who you can see on the left, often envision these park projects as collaborative with men, women, and children actively taking part. Um, so, Women connected emotionally to often representations of strong wo womanhood in these spaces. Um, oh, actually, I apologize. I, I have my slides out of order. This is a photo that would have been really beautiful just two seconds ago. It is a photo of the bulldozer takeover at Chicano Park. Um, and that photo was taken from the Chicano Park Museum. And so you can actually see women being part of this. There are really beautiful stories, for example, of uh, by Laura Rodriguez, um, who talks about how that day of literally taking over the bulldozer like changed her life. Um, and she became outspoken about social justice in her community and in the Chicano movement in San Diego. Um, and she, she really does describe that moment as like, I became a changed person. And she started um, like taking up public space, protesting sit-ins, takeovers, um, and sort of using her body in that way. Those stories are beautiful, especially of the uh, resistance um, against male-dominated murals are really amazing. And yet oftentimes those are not translated in the histories of these spaces, especially sort of the formal public histories of these spaces. Um, one image that I wanted to show you was um, about how women connect emotionally to these representations of strong womanhood in these spaces. So in a personal video recording of her artwork and music, Carlotta Hernandez Terry, who you can see on the right, she visited Chicano Park and she described her own experience painting and seeing the images of powerful womanhood um, within these spaces. Now this is important because it's not until the late 70s that women um, began to paint murals in Chicano Park and that's only because they just again take over the spot like going in the middle of the night and painting their own mural um, and I don't have a picture of the first mural they paint here unfortunately that was uh, a slip on my part but it's so beautiful because if I'm not mistaken the first mural that they paint is of these young um, uh, young women that are uh, standing in a cornfield. And so they're trying to, there's a very beautiful visual juxtaposition between the corn and her of like growing out through this, this earth. Um, so it's, it's beautiful. Um, so Terry stood in front of several murals she painted, including Chicano Park's Woman with Flag, which you can see at the left. Um, 
she, uh, painted to honor the International Delano Grape Strike by the United Farm Workers. So she's dressed in a blazer and she, uh, she's mimicking the painted subjects by similarly raising her clenched fist in a show of Chicana power. Her body is not only demanding to be recognized as a professional, but also becoming part of the image itself, as if to claim it as part of her own. Um, and this is important because she talks about how she painted murals there. Um, and so, for example, those women with the guns, um, she had her, her, that was her mural that she had originally painted, but she had painted guitars because she was a musician. Um, and yet she would go back, like she would leave the park and go back and men had painted over guns uh, in their hands and she would repaint over it. And so she said finally that she just gave up. Um, that it was a real struggle for some women to be able to um, use these spaces to represent their own political thoughts and identities. The only other photo I have here is of these uh, Miralisas later on. Um, and I think what's super, um, pardon my French, but total badass about these women is that they are using the internet and social media um, to A, not only document their art and document their struggle of producing art within these spaces, but to just celebrate this women's culture within this space. Um, so it's really, I think really amazing. So while murals were only a component for some people's parks, food was critical for many in building a community, often occupying public space by building bonfires for stews and hog roasts or picnic tables for shared dinners. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about food and race within these spaces and a little bit about gender. Garrett, can you give me a uh, audible, am I okay on time? Yeah, you're totally. Awesome, okay. Uh, so let's go into this. This is an artistic representation of uh, the Young Lords People's Park in Chicago. This is by Richard Levin, or Ricardo, yeah, Richard Levins, Ricardo Levins. Um, and he is a kid, if I'm not mistaken, like a young teenager when this park is being created. And so now he's an adult artist and made this uh, image to represent not only the Young Lords, but this park as a part of that um, spatial reclamation movement for the Young Lords, because they did many other takeovers in Chicago and in New York City. Um, and so it, in case you don't know Spanish, it just says, I have Puerto Rico in my heart. So for them, this space, uh, because of all the racism they were experiencing against Puerto Ricans in Chicago and in New York City across America, um, and this feeling like you need to assimilate, you need to leave Puerto Rico behind, and this is America, um, at the same time that they're facing police brutality because of be being working class people of color, they were adamant that like from the very beginning, this park, the Young Lords Poor, Poor People's Park, um, is going to be Puerto Rico. Like this is sort of this um, frontier, a, a magical borderland space in which they can sort of transist uh, geography and arrive in Puerto Rico and embrace that space. So because a variety of racial and ethnic groups created people's parks during this era, the racial, gender, class, and immigrant identities of park creators shape the cultural meanings of food constructed within these spaces. So for example, at this uh, at this park, Chicago's Poor People Park, um, there's a, a young woman who creates this Puerto Rican chicken soup, um, and it is a powerful statement of support for Puerto Rican pride. It's actually quite cool because uh, Stead's Turkle is on site at this park when it's being created. In case you don't know Turkle, he's a, a really famous oral historian based out of Chicago in this time period, um, and he had a radio show, and he did a ton of interviews with people, and so he's interviewing her as she's making this um, um, Puerto Rican soup, um, Puerto Rican chicken soup in the middle of this park. So it's a language with which to confront ethnic stereotypes, to articulate racial and ethnic self-determination, and sustain the labor of park occupiers. Like, you can't build a park without food. So while the foundation of of uh, chicken and rice form this hearty meal for the park's hordes of workers. The savory aroma of garlic and tomato sauce, bay leaf and vinegar, it just wafts through the park. And so as Turkle is there to interview people, all they can talk about is like, wow, this is amazing smell of the soup. Like, have you had the soup yet? Let's go and check out the soup. Um, and you can hear children running around, um, you know, moms helping other food being cooked, people, the sort of clinking of shovels in the background. Um, um, and people began to talk about her food like it's home cooking, like it's sort of, you're literally building a home and a community through food. 
So by ladling and passing a bowl of hot soup, park creators join together their shared family meal, converting a disheveled lot into a home. So uh, Puerto Rican Sioux shared in occupied public territories similarly transform vacant lots into community building projects in New York City's uh, Lower East Side, at Lower East Side. Uh, photographs by Gary Tyler of Plaza Caribe. It's a people's park built by squatters at the corner of 112th Street and Broadway. They show crowds of Puerto Ricans, African Americans and Polish Americans gathered on this occupied lot. Um, an artist painted several murals on the brick exterior of the tenement buildings lining the park, layering phrases like uh, liberation with images of armed revolutionaries of color. Um, and you can see again, like food is part of this. Off to the side, women stand at the table, their hands in large metal pots preparing a shared stew for everyone. Uh, food, again, closer to home in the Midwest, we can see a photo of James Rector's People's Park in Wisconsin. Uh, so sharing uh, soup not only warmed workers at Madison, Wisconsin's James Rector's People's Park. Now, if you don't know James Rector, um, again, to connect all these parks together, which is really cool, um, at Berkeley's People's Park, uh, it's created, and then there's a standoff. Please, please occupy it, uh, take it over. There's a protest march, and James Rector is a, just an innocent bystander like literally the the protest is huge it's like thousands and thousands of people and he is on a roof just watching um the protest and he is shot by police because they assume that he's a sniper um and so he's killed so he's sort of seen as this like martyr for the park movement that you can see his name his imagery of him being shot because he's just shot on the roof and people are trying to take care of him um he it sort of connects a lot of other parks together that are sort of like you can't murder people for building parks um and so that is what we can see here in Madison, Wisconsin. So it helps form this coalition. Um, but what's interesting about it is that here we can see several different ways that we're they're trying to build coalition. Um, first is that they use the park for um, what they're calling a Mexican dinner fundraiser for the United Farm Workers. Um, and it coincides with a protest on campus at the UW in support of the grape boycott. They're protesting grapes being served in the dining hall, if I'm not mistaken. So footage of the park's first anniversary Memorial Day celebration uh, on the right reveals a mostly, or no, sorry, on the left, uh, reveals a mostly white male college age crowd ladling a thick soup from a giant fire kindled communal vat um, or nodding in agreement with a rock band or performing on a small platform. Um, and so stapled under that uh, is the poster, the UFW poster, which you can, with the Aztec Eagle reading, um, Viva La Huelga, which is, um, uh, long live the strike. Okay. I got distracted one second. Okay, so the, although the park largely served as a hangout space for students and an outdoor concert venue for rock bands, um, this shared meal fundraiser became an opportunity for students to learn more about and connect with working class Chicano activists in the region. So meals like these not only celebrated mestizo culinary heritage, but facilitated racialized consumption as a medium of cross-cultural political organizing. Okay, and you have on the right, in case you don't know who that image is, that is Ho Chi Minh. Um, and so therefore they're really trying to build these transnational um, spaces. Okay, I am going, I'm running out of time because I get so excited. I could talk about this for days. Uh, and also because there's so much visual imagery of it, I could show you pictures for days and I think they're fascinating. Um, so beyond scavenging for midday snacks or campfire circles, two of the most common foods produced within activist occupations in public space were people stews and hog roasts. Um, and they function like rituals um, using sort of anti-capitalist culinary metaphors to po politicize these spaces as anti-establishment. So, he, and you had them, oftentimes they were called people stews. Um, so at Berkeley's People's Park, people stews were held every Saturday and Sunday at noon during the first few weeks of work. So stews large enough to feed hundreds often require collective management and assembly, as well as creative thinking that added to the park's aesthetic. Ingredients were boiled over the course of the workday in a metal trash can, which is what you see there, and stirred with a large wooden stick or a shovel, um, and uh, was, oh sorry, and served with a three foot long ladle or shovel and thousands of paper plates. 
Um, so smoke and steam billow from the can. Um, the steam is blocking views, yet crowds swarm the, uh, with arms outstretched to taste the experiment. Um, and so as in a celebration of the make-do ingenuity of what they called peasant food, stews were often collective creations with donated vegetables, grains, beans, and other scraps. It's a potluck style reenactment of a stone soup made from leftover ingredients without a specific recipe. Um, and so in her memoir, Wendy Schlesinger described the first people stew held at Berkeley's People's Park as a fundraising challenge for the park's organizers who solicited stores for donations of soup bones, vegetables, and bits of leftover meat. So video footage of a potluck prepared at People's Park number six, um, and that is after the park is created and fenced, and there's this massive protest because before and after James Rector is murdered, there it just sets off this um, huge movement of insurgent park creation in the Bay Area. Um, so, and they oftentimes didn't even, they're just like naming them like People's Park number six, People's Park number seven, um, to ally it with this original park. So um, you can see video footage of a, a potluck preparation at that park and it, uh, it's panning across these cardboard boxes of corn and string beans and onions and celery among other vegetables and prep for that day's people stew. Um, so in his documentary on Berkeley's People's Park titled Let a Thousand Parks Bloom, which is a still that you can see right here, filmmaker uh, Lenny Lipton captured a man stirring a waste high trash can full of rice and tomato based stew, um, while another man off to the side tossed a handful of basil leaves into the mixture. Um, so oftentimes you'd see like call outs for, for these potlucks of like, you know, bring spices, especially bring meat. Um, everyone wanted to bring vegetables, but it was really difficult to bring meat. Okay, so while, far, while for park creators of color, food became a way to celebrate their transnational, indigenous, and or multiracial identities, for white park goers, food sometimes became a medium with which to escape their privilege. Shared soups made from donations recreated the metaphorical American melting pot at the same time that they became a medium to critique American colonialism. Uh, Cross-cultural culinary fantasies that became a practice of what Stephanie Hartman has called appreciative inclusiveness. You can definitely see this more in looking at hog roast, which I could talk for so much time about. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. So park creators transfigured racialized metaphors onto spaces for food production and consumption as well as the food itself. So looking back on her first day of work in the parks, Lissinger compared the park's mud pit to a South Asian rice field, comparing the spectacle to what it must have been like to see two approaching water buffalo. Um, agricultural zones within the park included a miniature Mexican garden, um, were mentioned without explanation in an early supportive review of the park. Um, and so within the context of the Vietnam War and cross-cultural anti racist activism at home, bygone and foreign narratives of food production and consumption became exotic lenses through which to experience the park as more authentic than modern America, especially modern urban America in this era of um, urban renewal in which a lot of these older buildings are just getting bulldozed um, like no one's business. Okay, let me see. Okay, so problematic racial play, which again, if you have more questions about, I can talk more about. It often saturates the imagery of Berkeley's People's Park, um, often using narratives of visual and text narratives of African Americans as a way to politicize the park, especially anytime any Black Panthers would show up. So at the same time, park creators of color similarly used, ima used imaginative racial play to celebrate their transnational and multi-ethnic heritage. So parks became spaces where Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, and African Americans Americans could literally recover gentrified spaces with symbols of anti-colonial resistance. In an era of multiculturalism as a tool of cross-cultural coalition building, park creators from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds found these performances empowering. But does that visibility continue to translate into sources of cultural and political power for all marginalized groups? So in closing, I just wanted to draw a parallel, um, some I um, a parallel to some icon 
uh, some visual iconography between the People's Park movement in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and protests over the relationship between power and space today. Not to equate them, they are by no means um, the same, but just draw your attention to the ways in which similarities in visual material and performative culture of protests um, it, you can see. So for example, in this slide on the left, you can see a poster. This is a really famous poster for Berkeley's People's Park called Let a Thousand Parks Bloom. This on the right, um, oftentimes in this imagery, especially as, um, so this park movement starts in, this, in the late 60s. The next year is the first Earth Day in which you actually have like a greater articulation of we need to have an environmental justice movement. And Berkeley's People's Park is a a really important epicenter for talking about that. Um, and so you'd often see, um, I just couldn't find any when I was um, uh, finding this imagery, uh, but I there is imagery of plants covering cars, plants covering uh, buildings, wanting the, to let the earth reclaim itself. You can see that same thing in some iconography of the Black Lives Matter movement from this summer. Um, and here you can say more plants, less police. And in the background, if you can't see that, those are the names of people that have been murdered uh, by police. Here we can say, uh, see, uh, uh, Nicholas Galanin, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. My apologies if I am not. Um, this is, he's an artist, a super cool indigenous artist. Um, and this was his uh, project from this year um, for the Bien uh, Sydney Biennale, yeah, in which he he makes um, in this sort of era in which we are negotiating who do we want to see in public space? What powerful symbols do we want to see in space? How do we reclaim those symbols or reclaim these spaces? Um, and so he sort of turns it into a comic art piece in which the Captain Cook Memorial um, in Sydney's Hyde Park, he actually, because they've removed it, if I'm not mistaken, they've removed it. And so he, he cuts out this border as if it had fallen over and sort of sets up this but, um, but it's an art exhibit, it's a performance art piece um, or and visual art piece of um, taking over this land and reclaiming it um, for the people and sort of rejecting these older symbols of colonialism. In addition, you can see um, many parallels in, uh, for example, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle, um, in some of their programming, um, especially in ways that uh, it's covered by the media um, and some of the iconography. Um, you can also see that, for example, in doing some parallels with murals, but maybe the murals that we're seeing are not just covering um, boarded up stores um, in the middle of protests, but also on the streets themselves in which um, people are coming together, coalitions are coming together to paint the streets, to reclaim these streets as symbols um, of power. Finally, I just want to remind you that gender is still critical to this um, to this uh, iconography. Um, so for example, on the, on the right, you can see Wendy Schlesinger, um, Women's nude bodies, especially in this countercultural era, you know, during the sexual revolution, women's nude bodies become synonymous with the liberation of the park. If the park is liberated, if women are sexually liberated, we are liberated as a people. Um, and this on the right um, is a nude woman, I believe, in the Portland protest. Um, and newspapers described her um, disrobing herself and sort of sit, sitting out open in front of the police as this uh, really beautiful moment. They called her an Athena um, and of how fragile her body was. But I want to say that it's, it's interesting because a lot of um, people of color, their nude bodies, especially as they're being attacked by police, are not talked about in the same way, as noble, as beautiful, as fragile, um, as something that needs to be protected. Um, and so I, I also wanna point out about the intersection of gender and race, that a lot of times in these, in these movements, um, white women's uh, beauty and nudity is sort of seen again as forms of liberation, while other, uh, especially people of color, their nudity is not. So just some things to think about. Um, I just wanted to uh, offer some interesting similarities since we're talking about taboo topics and historians don't talk about the current day. I wanted to 
go ahead and um, mess up that uh, and show you some interesting parallels. Um, and I wanted to thank you again, and I really look forward to your questions and comments right now. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can hear them. Well, thank you. I'm also going to put in the chat the survey link for people that might have a quick class to run or other event or something, but we're going to use the rest of this time to have questions and discussions. So there's that link. And then um, if you would like to ask questions, comments, whatever, just unmute yourself and go ahead and we'll figure out the messiness of Zoom while we do it. I think even uh, to ask a rhetorical question to open it up to people. Um, whenever I talk about people's parks, it's you have to go through this period of their brain, like you can see their brain kind of exploding because they're like, I don't understand people taking over vacant lots and converting them into parks. That's illegal. Um, why are they doing that? And so a lot of what I study is that there, many of these park creators didn't expect these parks to be permanent, that they're seeing this as um, a protest of power and space. And so I would like to encourage anyone to, to even if you don't, you know, think about it now, think about it later, about what do you see as the relationship between power and space, especially urban green space, um, and how do you uh, fit identity in with that? Um, so that's some pondering thoughts. I have a question I was thinking about to maybe kick it off is, um, you talked a lot about how these spaces in the parks themselves and the people there were performing masculinity. Um, and that my sustainability mind went off because it's, that's why, uh, you know, we trace back a lot of issues with um, environmental degradation down to masculinity and toxic masculinity and the need to perform um, their dominance over mother nature, right? Mm -hmm. So that whole um, concept. And then you juxtapose it with like guerrilla gardening and the muralists um, and their, how their involvement in these parks often changes the spaces. Um, and changes the conversation. So I, I'm wondering if, and I don't really know where I'm going with this, but what necessarily the connection is there now with um, continuing to perform masculinity within um, all leadership of movements, so not just people's parks, and this is for everyone as well, um, of what connections you all see with that right because this is a prime example of that mm -hmm. uh, so I don't I can definitely give you as far as um, in thinking about the history of this movement um, so for example um, the internet did wonders for people that did not get a voice during the 60s and 70s in this in these movements so you can actually um, go back like uh, the internet is created and becomes accessible and activists go online to create web pages about their protests like immediately. Um, so you'll still have this uh, many of the people wanting to tell the singular narrative, um, but also the idea that um, people of color that women people marginalized in these groups people um, wanting to uh, both challenge and like think nostalgically about these spaces, the internet is a place for that. So I would only say that um, had there not been the internet with which to access, like to create a platform for especially women um, to talk about this and to organize around this and network, like it's kind of amazing. Like even like as a historian, like also kind of a brain explosion to look on to Facebook groups and see these activists, like these original park creators, like chatting with one another um, on group messages uh, or that you can see. And it's like, oh my gosh, they're using Facebook right now. Like this is history happening. Um, so I would, I would say that that's the only thing. I don't know about a parallel to today. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not really good at, um, um, at 
I, I don't know if I could give a good answer on that, but definitely that there is this, it's still a huge tension between, um, because a lot of these park creators are frustrated because they felt like um, the sort of mainstream establishment media never let them have a real voice about their park and couldn't actually let them get their issues um, out there. Immediately, you know, if, if they're talking about police brutality or urban renewal or things like that, the media, uh, the mainstream media is um, quickly going into, you know, just like we do today, what are your criminal, uh, criminality, um, why you don't deserve to be here, um, you don't even belong here, like you're not a, um, you're not a local. Um, and so I think that there is still absolutely this tension over what does uh, what do these spaces mean for people? You can definitely see that with Berkeley's People's Park because even though it still exists, it is a it is a literal like battleground uh, between the state and these um, sort of last uh, park creators that are hanging on, um, trying to argue that this this is about shared right to space um, and the university that's like this is about we should have dorms like you know, you're being selfish. So I don't know if I answered that very well, other than to say the internet really helped marginalized groups a lot tell their story, but it doesn't mean that they have rectified this in any way that wherever there is or political organizing, there is always uh, marginalized groups and um, sexism and racism and classism and all that stuff. Homophobia as well, I didn't even get into that. Okay, so there's a chat, a question. Um, I would like to know my opinion when they remove statues and symbols from the past that has to do with slavery, is it trying to erase history? My opinion? Um, I would say my opinion on that is no, but mainly that's because um, there is a great book um, and I'm gonna show you, I always like to show book covers. So one, show, share my screen. Shout out to Kirk. Savage who wrote this book, Standing Soldiers Kneeling Slaves, um, one of several books, don't get me wrong, on monuments in this era. Uh, Kirk Savage does more about visual culture um, and so understanding the symbolism of these monuments and it was really eye-opening for me because again I'm from Georgia, I come from a place of um, in which this legacy in statue form is normalized, like it's just something that you see every single day um, in a way that, for example, I'm in a Korea. That is, it's not something that you would see here. And he does a really good job uh, of talking about the, the symbolism in these monuments of not only about how they're created intentionally in an, in an era of um, uh, trying to protect the legacy of Confederate soldiers as they're getting older, um, uh, uh, sort of corresponds with a rise in the KKK, but the symbolism within the monuments of, for example, that's why he titles it Standing Soldiers and Kneeling Slaves, um, of even, for example, in this um, monument that you can see here, um, of, of uh, the sort of reinforcing the idea that African Americans needed to, they owed their, um, their freedom to white male leaders like Lincoln rather than fighting for their freedom and earning their freedom. Um, so I would just suggest that um, I don't think it's erasing history because if you uh, for example, museums change all the time and you have to swap out exhibits um, and certain times you don't show certain exhibits doesn't mean that you've erased history. It just means that you're you're talking about other things. Um, you can always um, talk about that same topic in a different way in the future. But again, that's my opinion. Happy to listen to other opinions on that though. I have a question for the group and maybe the sustainability folks um, and everyone should be a sustainability folk. So <laughs> that's all of you, but I I'm wondering if anyone can think of um, ways that urban spaces are used in a similar way currently, because I, I'm thinking of some, but I would also like to see if other people have thought about it at all throughout this, because there definitely are. Yeah, I would also love to hear because especially um, the local connections with this. So for example, here in Korea, 
super tight control on what you can do in space. Um, but it's super interesting because um, I'm looking out onto our campus right now and there's this sort of vast undeveloped land. And um, it is very expensive to live in this community because it's on, um, my brain isn't working, but it's on newly built land. Like they're taking over the water and building uh, land. And so it means that flat farmland is hard to find. And so a lot of the poor um, immigrants here go into the those high brush areas and build their own farms that you can't see from the side. You can see from our tall buildings. Um, and it's very interesting because, um, I don't try to def define park like it's about programming and I understand that certain places are for gardens but when you have spaces out there for socializing and you have spaces out there for gardening and you have spaces that spaces out there for um, community building like it's it is in some ways you can see some parallels so yeah I would love to hear other people and their own thoughts about some some things that you can see in your own community in Indiana or elsewhere. Oh, Garrett, what's, what are the ones you're thinking of? So um, <clears throat> recently and continuing are um, movements um, related around food insecurity um, in urban centers uh, and uh, tree canopies. Um, mm. and like graphic, for urban heat? Urban heat? Yeah, what do you and, call that? Uh, and how people are grafting fruit tree branches onto urban trees um, that are used along the sidewalks and um, garden spaces and park spaces um, and using those as ways to provide for the community. Um, doing it in secret in the night, right? That's, that's the one that immediately came to my head. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'm also one that I like to use um, that I, again, so I uh, am from Atlanta. And so even going back there, there's a really vibrant, like informal art scene there. Um, some are big murals, but some are actually like really small and sort of gets you to pay attention to these little details. But it reminds me in hearing you talk of, um, I don't know if you guys know the Pansy Project. It is... I don't think this image really helps. It's just a pansies, but I'll share it anyway because I'm sure it is. But the Pansy Project is uh, an anti-homophobia project in which I forget the name of the the Paul Harfleet. Paul Hartley, um, in which he started that every account of homophobia, like it's crowdsourced. So every account of homophobia in London, if I'm not mistaken, he would plant a pansy and he would record it, like take a photo and record what happened there. But as a way of like healing these spaces for people um, and also bringing symbolism because of the pansy of um, as historically being um, uh, uh, a, a code that you could use to say that you were queer, but also a, a, a slur that you would later use to, against uh, queer people. And so it's a really beautiful, like quiet, but beautiful way of changing the narrative about spaces um, while allowing people to um, reclaim, share their identity within those spaces, maybe even in ways that like are not always uh, welcome. throw it out one last time to say, does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything? And if you don't want to unmute, feel free to put it in the chat. It's hard to peer pressure on Zoom. <laughs> it's true. Normally when I do, I've taught on Zoom this year since February, and it is like most of the time the students, I'll give you a taste of what life is like in Korea. The students they'll do this and you only see the tops of their heads and you're like, okay, top head number one, top head number two, give me this. Okay, so I see um, a chat. For the B Black Lives Matter movement, street corners that have not filled in my lifetime have been utilized to voice those views. Yes, absolutely. Sh tell, tell me especially what you're seeing in um, Indiana. Are you seeing anything else in Indiana? Are you thinking about other cities? 
I so I said that um I'm from St. Louis and we have a lot of like that's a really big center for um Black Lives Matter and so just like driving around like I just see like many protests that have been organized by like younger people even um that have just been in places I've never seen any kind of uh groupage before but also in Indiana like there was kind of like a rally thing at the courthouse the courthouse I think it's called um and so like taking up new spaces that like weren't really used before because of like a hyper um politicized climate I guess is kind of what I'm seeing I don't know awesome oh yes that's our chat thank you Lil. Yeah, I also think it's interesting. Like, I wanted to uh, ask everyone, like, well, how do you define sustainability? Um, and I mean, maybe you're thinking about the environment, maybe you're thinking about political movements, social change, but also how do you define use? Because that is such a like contested term of many of these park creators are saying, you know, in light of urban renewal in this area, um, that when you demolish a building that affordable housing that people lived in and it hasn't been new affordable housing hasn't been created, it's not its best use. So therefore, an informal park, community created, is the best use. And then often the critics are like, that's an inappropriate use. We need to have an appropriate use for it. Um, and so uh, I think use is an interesting word of like, what does it mean? Who's using that word to defend things um, when, on, on, on any side? Oh, there were protests there in uh, Terre Haute during the summer for Black Lives Matter. I am very impressed with Indiana. And at, for context, actually, it started a whole um, organization here called Change Terre Haute. Really? What is that? They are working to, with racial justice at the center, but all um, sorts of change for Terre Haute um, and working with local um, businesses, also the local government, and then the sustainability part of me, they are doing community cleanups as well. Mm, okay, perfect. Yeah, and um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but the reason, one of the reasons why I'm here is because Garrett listened to the Talking Hoosier History podcast in which I'm interviewed on that about my research. And I would say the reason why I'm connecting to that is A, it's a great podcast, especially about local history, but B, um, I had a really interesting discussion with the host because part of her job is to work in creating those, um, like the roadside markers for public history. And that is hugely contested. Cause like even talking about like how the internet created space for people that are marginalized in these groups to communicate, like who controls historical markers um, that is still highly contested. So like even let alone like take down a statue, like just create a historical marker is enough to like send people like who's going to pay for it what the language that you want them to use um and she had some her own stories about how they were creating uh, markers about um historical violence um and that certain cities would be like no you're not allowed to put the marker here even if it happened um they're just like no you're not allowed to do it um uh, but it's interesting because again i'm from georgia um like historic another historical like kkk um center and the, some of those histor just creating historical markers about racial violence is an act of protest because those historical markers i'm thinking of um this woman named mary um in lowndes county and i can't think of her last name but she was brutally um murdered publicly and uh, the women's studies department at the Valdosta State, if I'm not mistaken, created a historical marker for her about what happened to her. And it is still shot regularly to this day and they have to keep just replacing the marker. So again, what stories get to be told, the use of that space, like history I think is very um, important to that. And if you're talking about sustainability, like. I think it is an interesting thing to talk about not only environmental sustainability but like sustainability of social change and like uh, is is talking about marginalized groups can we make that sustainable um talking about histories of violence um and overcoming that violence can we make that sustainable i think that's still even highly contested let alone use of vacant lots
All right, well, I wanna be cognizant of people's time um, and offer up, I think I said one last time the last time, but this time one last time. <laughs> um, um, any questions, comments, or discussion items that you would like to bring forth? In a moment of silence for folks. Also, I would say, because I have so much iconography here, um, and I was trying to make some parallels, um, if you find stuff, like it, local stuff or anywhere that seems to make those connections about like plants taking over police cars or like, please send them to me. I always think they're so fascinating. You can tag me in them, you can send them to me. Um, I think that would be really, really awesome for me. Because that's what I study is this, especially visual material culture um, of protest. And so I, I always think that's really fascinating. So please reach out. All right, well, no one else unmuted. So I'm gonna take that as a sign. Um, but I wanna thank you for your time. Um, I also want to thank everyone else for their time here. Um, this was great for me. Um, I hope it was great for everyone else as well. And the students that I have here, we're going to have a follow-up convo about it. So be prepared. Um, but Dr. Kira Lavelle, do you have anything last you want to say? No, thank you so much. It was really awesome to share. Um, and I, I look forward if you guys in the discussion think about things like questions or concerns or comments like you're always welcome to connect with me um i love